who don't know, my name is Rebecca Jackson. I am the director of the Center for Clinical and Translational Science at The Ohio State University. Um, the CCTS was funded um, back in 2008, so a long time ago when I was a little girl. Um, and, um, the, and the primary goal and vision um, of the Clinical and Translational Science Award from Dr. Zerfuni, when he really kind of envisioned, um, was a re-engineering of the clinical and translational science ecosystem. And, and one of the real concerns is that we've had incredible advances over the last, um, you know, 50 to 100 years in terms of basic science discovery. Um, but the ultimate goal, of course, is not just that area of discovery, but in fact to translate that in ways that actually ultimately improve the human condition. And as many of you know, um, that has not been a terribly efficient process. Um, so that from the actual discovery um, of anything, for example, the Human Genome Project, to the actual first advantages or the first treatments or diagnostics, um, in general, takes more than 17 years. And in addition to taking that long period of time, the overwhelming majority of new ideas actually fail along that translational science process. So the goal of the CTSA program, as he envisioned it, was to really bring together people from multiple different perspectives and areas to begin to look at research translation and to find ways to make this more efficient, more effective, and more innovative. Um, innovative by actually including the stakeholders from the very beginning in terms of understanding how these would impact the lives of the people that we hope to serve. One of the components of that, and as a scientist, um, you know, I always thought about translation as moving my research from the bench to the bedside um, to, the, to the hospital, and then fitting together kind of the public policy or other aspects that allow it to be sustainable. But what I never thought about really was how do you actually make that happen? Um, and, and one of the things that, that certainly I was never trained in, and probably many of you weren't, is in that area actually of entrepreneurship and commercialization. So if we all think about innovation from the way that I originally learned the word, um, and the way I looked at that word prior to 2008, which is creativity um, rather than innovation in terms of actually making solutions that change things and that are things that are valued by stakeholders, it's a very different mindset and one that we hope that as scientists will all wear both of those hats and look at it both from the creativity and how we actually do things in a transformative ways, but also look to say, and how do we actually get these forward? So really from that, really born a whole set of efforts at the CTSA and the CCTS here at the Ohio State University about how could we encourage or how could we build out a system where we both support research translation by an actually multi-directional communication and collaboration, uh, build out team science because we know for in order for translation to be effective, we have to have multiple people working together from different perspectives to be able to do that. And also look about how do we make this sustainable. So how do we look at this in terms of of both entrepreneurship and commercialization. And we've done this in a number of different ways. We've developed training programs, and we now have training programs within our KL2 and TL1 programs that are available to understand both innovation, commercialization, and entrepreneurship. Um, and I hope many of you, when we do our next course on the business of science together um, with Fisher, um, will consider um, applying for that and really spend the three days in that workshop, which I think is an incredibly valuable use of time um, to really be able to understand those business principles that somebody forgot to ta teach us before we all developed our lab. The second thing is that we developed out a pilot program that really focused on methodologies and other things. So in addition to thinking about it, from a pilot program that really looked at the science, we also looked at pilot programs where the things that you're developing out have a greater impact that might be adopted by other individuals because we're all, in fact, developing innovative and new approaches towards answering questions that, in fact, may go across multiple different disciplines and domains and make a difference, which is scientific impact, or may ultimately lead to something 
um, that is commercializable, which would have an impact on a more societal basis. And then lastly, um, we're bringing together, really trying to create a community around um, entrepreneurship and commercialization. So we work together with Mary Uhas and others um, in Project Reach in, in, in the past. Um, and a lot of the efforts that she's done to really expand the footprint um, of thinking about entrepreneurship. And really through this, we built out and really kind of developed this idea of bringing together a monthly group to learn from successful entrepreneurs about their story, what were the things that went well, where were the challenges, what kind of opportunities do we have to support that across the Ohio State University and nationwide children. And so today is the inaugural um, session um, regarding this. It's a monthly series. That'll be during both the fall and the, whatever you call this semester, the winter spring semester. Um, so it'll be um, done on, on, on a monthly basis. Um, you've seen the schedule for, for this semester, and I hope that you'll be able to attend um, all of these. Um, and we hope it's something that will excite you. It'll give you some opportunities to network with individuals, to reach out to us. This is a partnership, and just like science takes a team, so does putting on a program or actually supporting the area of, of entrepreneurship as a team as well. And, and our team includes our partners at Nationwide <laughs> Children's Hospital, um, who are close partners together with us um, in the Center for Clinical and Translational Science. Um, the Office of Corporate Engagement, um, including some of the efforts around technology commercialization, um, but much broader than that in thinking about how do we work and how do we translate that um, further, um, and, and a host of other individuals and other colleges, um, which you'll see kind of scrolling through and at the bottom of the materials um, that you're handed out. And so we want this to be interactive. We want you to be able to ask your questions um, and we hope that you'll give us feedback on the things that will be most useful, and that includes other programming that we can do. What kinds of things will allow you to be successful that we can put together across nationwide in Ohio State so that you can take your best and most exciting ideas and ultimately improve human health from prevention to diagnostics to treatment um, and, and ultimately to sustainability. So thank you all for attending today, and I'd like to turn the, the floor over um, for a little, for additional information, so. Is this on? Yep. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. I, I really appreciate those comments, and I, I don't think I could say anything she said better. Um, there's a tremendous opportunity here in this monthly seminar series for all of us to interact with each other, learn from each other, and help to further foster a culture of commercialization, which I think is a really, really important part of the full life cycle of academic research and why we do research and in Nationwide Children's um, you know, portfolio, particularly life science research. And so I know at Nationwide Children's, we've worked hard over the last few years to make sure that we are creating that culture of entrepreneurship and that culture of commercialization, and we are really interested in programs that help to foster that. Um, one thing in particular that's been exciting over the last uh, year or two is the opportunity that we've had to work closer with our colleagues here at The Ohio State University and, and do some joint ventures with them. One thing in particular that we're really excited about to help support this type of activity is a Catalyst Life Sciences Fund that we just recently co-funded together with The Ohio State University to um, support life science startups coming out of our institutions. And for us, that collaborative effort with Ohio State was something we're really excited about and excited to work with them on and have actually made a couple of our first or, or some of our initial investments out of that fund. Um, but you know, I, I have nothing really to say beyond the fact that we're, we're happy to be a part of this. We're really thankful to the CCTS and to Tanya Matthew for, for setting this up and for being kind of the point on getting this rolling. Somewhere across town right now in the Galaxy Lounge, there should be several people at NCH watching this as well. Hello to my NCH brethren that are out there. Um, but thank you very much. We're looking forward to this. I think it should be a great opportunity for everybody.
Good morning. I'd like to add my welcome and thanks to all of you for attending this first session, both those of you who are in the room today, those of you who are uh, across town, and those of you who might be watching this on delay. Um, I want to uh, tell you how exciting it is to be partnering with, <clears throat> with Dr. Matt McFarland and his team at the uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital Office of Technology Commercialization, and uh, Dr. Bruce Weinberg, and Carolyn Crisofoli, and Tanya Matthew, and uh, Dr. Jackson at uh, CCTS. Uh, those of us who are involved in commercialization are painfully aware of uh, how many inventors and would-be inventors really don't know how to take steps to move your ideas forward toward the marketplace. So I'm confident that this program that we're uh, launching today is going to both educate and inspire you uh, to have a much better idea about how to move your ideas forward. And I want to thank CCTS and the team that I mentioned for taking the leadership on pulling us all together to make this happen. Let me, uh, <clears throat> let me just mention the, uh, the Corporate Engagement Office, the two functions that are most relevant to this gathering. Uh, by the way, I don't think I introduced myself. Scott Osborne, Vice President of the Corporate Engagement Office at The Ohio State University. Um, the, uh, the, the two areas of, of our team that are most relevant to this topic are uh, the Technology Commercialization Office and uh, formerly the New Ventures Office, now the Keenan Center for Entrepreneurship and its new director, uh, Cheryl Turnbull, who has previously led our uh, new ventures effort. She stepped into that role. I appointed her, and she stepped into that role just a week ago today. So you're going to be hearing much more about that in the future, just as you will the Catalyst 2 Fund. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kevin Taylor, who's the Associate Vice President for Technology Commercialization here at Ohio State. Kevin. Good morning. Let me see if I can get to my, oh, Tanya's going to help me. <clears throat> Great. Sorry, there we go. Ah, that was easy. Great. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. As Scott said, I'm the Associate Vice President for Technology Commercialization within our Corporate Engagement Office. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, this morning. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our office and the services we provide to um, faculty and staff and researchers here at the university. Um, before I do, I'm going to give you a little bit of my background um, so you know kind of where I'm coming from. First of all, uh, this is a return home for me. Um, I, uh, after spending 25 years in technology commercialization, primarily in the healthcare space, um, I'm, it's good to be back at, o, at Ohio State. I started here as an undergraduate. I have a BS in electrical engineering, and then I went on to get a master's um, in electrical engineering. I followed that with a master's in technology and innovation management out of the University of Sussex in England. Uh, it turns out England, about 50 or 60 years ago, um, kind of began developing the whole concept of technology management and the science policy research unit at University of Sussex was a pioneer in the space, and so that laid um, an important uh, part of the foundation for me and the journey I took in healthcare commercialization. Across my uh, career, I've been involved in everything from developing medical devices and clinical laboratory in instruments, imaging systems, to um, being involved in investing in early stage companies that had an innovative idea that they wanted to take to market. Um, uh, to, uh, to operating at scale at Cardinal Health. I had a, uh, over a billion dollar uh, product portfolio, sold in 35 countries. We had all aspects of um, manufacture and distribution and sales and marketing. And I saw what it meant to operate at that scale. And then most recently before coming to Ohio State, I was with an artificial intelligence company specializing in cognitive AI. Um, focused in energy, and we were looking at branching out into um, healthcare. So uh, 
my career again has all been has been about technology commercialization, and I'm excited to be here at the university. Um, as Scott said, our corporate engagement office uh, covers a number of areas that are relevant to um, innovation. We have a, a robust team on corporate business development where we look for build relationships with industry partners to do research and to engage in the university in a number of ways. Um, we have the function of technology commercialization with Try Lead, the Keenan Center for Entrepreneurship, and the new ventures function that exists in it. And then we have a strong um, focus on economic development. As, the, as Ohio State, we have a significant role to play in the community, in the region, and in the state. When you look at technology commercialization, um, it follows a cycle. And researchers and faculty, staff, you really are at the beginning of that cycle. You're the ones who are facing problems and trying to figure out how can we do this better. And you do research and you come up with ideas. And the question is how do you get that into the market? How do you have an impact on people's lives? And you're involved actually across this, this entire cycle, but the emphasis on what you do really begins with that germination of an idea. Technology commercialization at Ohio State, we focus on teaming with you before you, you know, right at the start, as, as early as you're willing to bring us into the loop and working with you to capture your idea, we assess the potential for it, we look at the market, we develop protection strategies, um, we'll market the technology to uh, potential companies that you could license, to, license it to or work with our partners in new ventures to look at whether a startup is appropriate and we'll license the technology. This is all a service we provide and we work closely with the staff that come to us with ideas. Again, New Ventures gets involved if it is, if it's appropriate to start up a company, if that's something that you want to do. And we have a set of services that we wrap around to you at that point um, in the development cycle. And then external partners play a critical role. They're the ones that have um, the infrastructure, the scale, the reach to customers, and the ability to attract capital necessary to advance your idea into a product or a service that has an impact on people's lives. When you look at the services that we provide, um, it really, again, encompasses the red, the areas in, in red, but we, we will at any time talk to you about commercialization. If you have any questions, maybe you don't even have an idea yet that you want to talk to us about, but you want to learn about commercialization, we're here for you and we're happy to engage you. Again, we provide invention protection so your idea is protected in a way that can allow you to take it forward um, through commercialization as a translation uh, channel for you. We provide licensing, startup support, and then compliance services. So once we license your technology and it's in the market, we make sure that the commercial partners are doing what they've committed to do and that we're also um, ensuring that as funds come in, we're distributing them uh, back to you and to your colleges and departments. Okay. Our team, so um, across new ventures and technology commercialization, we have over 25 staff at the university who are focused every day on serving our customers. And we, we are focused on customer service. We recognize that we're a customer service organization. And we are striving to be collaborative we want to be transparent through the process so that you can, if, if you're new to technology commercialization, you can learn. If you're an expert, you can, you can be involved in the process and helping to guide um, the path forward. We are solution oriented. We're not the office of no. We need to be the office of how. Like how do we make this happen? And we're responsive. And we're building, we're, we're continually looking at how can we be more responsive and more effective as a customer service organization. This is just a, th these pictures are pictures of just a few people on the team. In fact, we have some of them in the audience. If you're on the tech commercialization or new ventures team, could you raise your, raise your hand so the audience can see? Yeah, thank you. You'll recognize some of the faces here uh, on the slide. So how's the university doing with translation through commercialization. Overall, we're seeing increases in patent volume, 
the licenses that we're putting in place with companies, and the number of startups that we're forming. Now, this isn't just a game about numbers. It's a game about, it's, it's really about quality and quantity. Quantity is a measure of how, uh, you know, how we're engaging, I think, with our researchers. But we're really concerned about the quality of the research that, that's, that we're, we're helping to enable and, and, and move into the market. So when we see 118 patents issued, um, you know, 76 new license deals, 14 new startups, that all represents an opportunity for Ohio State and its researchers to have an impact on the world, and we're excited by that. So just, just a couple of um, examples I wanted to bring forward. Um, doc, I'm sorry, Karen Pranger and uh, Sheila Chukta had created or had an idea for an intravenous access port that really helped address some issues with um, uh, opioid abuse and current IV, por IV ports. They had a way to show um, when an IV port had been tampered with and not, and not used by a medical professional. And um, this is one where we worked with, with Karen and others and um, moved this forward into a license deal with an existing company, and it's moving forward to be in the market. Dr. Nimji. Um, Dr. Nimji has a really exciting technology that is re it's a reversal, reversible thrombolytic aptamer, and um, it it's, it's, has great potential to, uh, to improve on current stroke um, treatments in a way that avoids a major issue, which is, is um, uh, hemorrhage, where his technology allows you to address the occlusion and then reverse, um, reverse the medication so that you re reduce the likelihood of, uh, of a, um, of a hem hemorrhagic issue. Another is um, one by Dr. Dayoud, and this is an esophageal displacement device for cardiovascular procedures. And this is one where, with a displacement device, you can greatly reduce the risk of damage um, during cardioablation surgery. Again, this is one that's moving forward. Um, it was licensed to a spin out company, uh, S4 Medical, and the company has raised over a million dollars. So these are just three examples of collaborations that we've had. Um, as I said earlier, we focus on transparency and empowering our, our faculty, the faculty, staff, and researchers that work with us. We just want to point you to our website where we have an inventor's guide to technology transfer, which is a 15 or 16 page guide that talks about the tech transfer process. We have access to our invention disclosure forms and instructions. You'll find the IP policy there that governs what, uh, how Ohio State um, treats intellectual property and how our office uh, operates. You'll find faculty creator startup guidelines. So if you're a faculty member that wants to create a company, um, there are uh, pre-negotiated terms that we have available to faculty as well as uh, a whole series of services that we wrap around you to support you. And then if you're interested in industry-sponsored research, we also have guidelines for that and, and a document. And so you'll find these um, at the links here, but feel free to go out to our website. Finally, um, we're here to serve, and we're here to serve you, and we're eager to help you. And so, again, please go to our website. If you have an interest, we'll come to you, and wherever you are, um, we'll work at, on your schedule. And um, our office is just 10 minutes away on High Street, just down 10th Avenue, and we'd love to see you and host you in our office. So thank you very much, and I hope to uh, be working with, with each of you over the coming year. So I'm sure that you were all excited to hear us um, start the morning, but it was really, um, I think, to begin to lay the foundation for you to realize that there are resources across nationwide in Ohio State, and you're going to be hearing more about these over the coming months um, as we get a little bit more granular about some of the different aspects of that entire journey. Um, but uh, I think we can't hear it better. Um, than from 
um, those that have had experience. So I'm absolutely thrilled today to introduce our inaugural speaker um, for this workshop series, um, Dr. Shu Doss. Um, so I have been privileged to know Shu um, since the earliest days of the Center for Clinical and Translational Science. He was one of our original KL2 awardees, which are the Career Development Awards, um, focusing at that time at really beginning to understand um, the, to start to differentiate um, viral and bacterial infections in the sinuses, and how could we avoid overuse of antibiotics. Um, and what Gail do is kind of walk you through some of the journey um, that has ultimately resulted in being truly one of our most successful entrepreneurs, an incredible um, physician, incredible scientist, and truly a good friend of the Ohio State University. Joe, thank, thank you so thank much you for so attending. Thank you so much, Dr. Dexter. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. It's a um, uh, <coughs> uh, true honor to come back and be able to talk to you guys. Um, so I guess to start with disclosures, and my um, disclosures also kind of tell my story, so I'll spend a little bit more time on these than I guess typical, but um, I started with a uh, KL2 award, as Dr. Jackson had mentioned, and um, uh, fortunately that was able to translate uh, with the help of my mentor to becoming an R01 supplement on one of her grants that I'll talk to you guys a little bit about from there. Um, uh, in about 2013, I transferred over kind of into the commercialization world, and so funding started to become from external sources. Um, along that same path, Plotway, um, uh, I uh, developed um, our patents, and we um, also gained very valuable outside consulting experience, which I'll also talk about. But uh, as a result, I have now a lot of disclosures. Uh, anyway, my, so for the talk, uh, for these 20 minutes, I thought I would start with kind of my life history at Ohio State and um, kind of the lessons and pitfalls that I've gone through and hopefully uh, will be very helpful to you guys. Um, so a genesis of my first idea, the, kind of the timeline of development, a list of the resources that we used, and then lessons learned and some practical tips. So uh, to start, I am... Um, Started as a traditional otolaryngologist, an academic otolaryngologist. I went to um, University of Virginia for college, University of North Carolina for residency. Did my fellowship in advanced uh, rhinology and skull-based surgery at the Medical College of Georgia. And uh, my first uh, major promotion was to become the director of sinus surgery here. Uh, and that's when I joined in about 2008. Uh, my interest was in um, biofilms and so uh, I got very lucky to um, get paired with Lauren Bakelitz, who is um, uh, an honor that she's in the audience. Um, really, the probably the premier scientist on bi on biofilms in the um, country, and was on the NIDCD, was on the Scientific Council, was really also one of the premier researchers that the NIH supported. But to say that um, the experience in her lab was like completely pivotal in my career is almost an understatement. She um, really, like a lot of labs, just demanded exceptional quality and an exceptional timeline, which is, uh, you know, in academics, it's really rare to see that kind of, you know, um, desire for quality and speed that uh, is very much mimics the business world. But it was a phenomenal experience for me and really kind of shaped my career. But I started kind of trying in the same line of, um, you know, following her footsteps and following what I think a lot of academic scientists do, uh, trying to just develop an academic career. Um, initially, we were looking at the secretome of uh, a homophilus biofilm and seeing if there are ways to distinguish this between um, uh, homophilus and other types of infections you get in the sinuses. Uh, but a key, one of the key changes to my career, um, and I don't think Dr. Jackson will realize this, but it was really in the, um, in the specific aims and the approach on my grant application for the KL2 award uh, here at the university. In that grant, um, in applying for that grant, I had to um, specifically talk about how the aims of my project uh, were going to cause clinical and translational impacts. And just 
looking at that grant application made me start to really think about research in a totally different way, like how am I going to make this practical? You know, what is the importance of the secret tome? So with Lauren's help, um, uh, over maybe a course of several months, we, we kind of really decided that the, probably the best way was to try to develop a test uh, that could be used clinically uh, that could distinguish between viral and bacterial uh, sinus infections. And so um, that, that really then completely kind of changed the focus of my research. It kind of made me um, into like a nice offshoot of what Lauren was doing. And so it really also kind of helped me develop my own path in towards of how I wanted to progress at OSU. In any case, we um, uh, created a chinchilla model for sinusitis and um, uh, validated several biomarkers um, uh, to look for um, potential targets that could be used um, uh, to, to develop this test between viral and bacterial sinusitis. Uh, that ended up, uh, I won the 2013 Fowler Award, which is a very big basic science uh, award in our field. The um, media office of OSU then um, really helped me publish that. They got me a lot of new spots like this one on CNN, and it really then kind of launched my career um, uh, into uh, commercialization. Anyway, the um, initial concepts then, uh, I then got the fortune of working with Paul Reeder, who uh, is also here, and so I'm very grateful. Um, uh, the prototyping office from the corporate engagement office then helped us work, create these beautiful slides, create beautiful prototypes, which uh, really then helped me land my first licensing spot, which took about uh, a year or so um, with a startup company in Austin, Texas. Anyway, they um, developed uh, what is now the Sinutest, which um, is in uh, the final stages of clinical trials for an FDA approval. We I had to raise about $3 million to start the company, about $5 million for this clinical trial, and that clinical trial is progressing through Texas now. Uh, we had to then develop an optical reader for our test, but uh, hopefully this will con continue along. This actually uh, was interesting. The um, Coming out of the university, I actually had probably less control over this idea than the other companies that I've started. Um, but this one by far taught me the most about how to commercialize, how, you know, what the process is. And it's very, very different than, um, uh, you know, typical clinical research. So it was almost like starting another residency after I decided to go private and go down this road. Anyway, so my life has been, um, has taken weird twists and turns. I became a tooth model um, for this uh, startup company that worked on a teeth whitener. Um, and then I uh, was lucky to go on the Today Show and talk about some of our research and um, have gotten a lot of press um, over that research since. Um, oh, this slide got messed up. The, um, uh, the latest, I just got back from Vegas yesterday. We um, have been working on this uh, new device uh, to treat headaches um, called um, uh, ClearUp. And uh, that uh, just one... Uh, Last Gadget Standing uh, People's Choice Award, which is one of the biggest awards at the Consumer Electronics Show. So I um, have just gotten back from a week of kind of pitching that and working on a deal for that. So in any case, um, I, um, I have kind of fully gone to um, uh, developing products and trying to get these off the ground. Um, the latest one also, I'm working with two, children, two surgeons at Children's to develop a... Um, a mouth guard to prevent tonsillectomy burns for uh, children who undergo tonsillectomies. We unfortunately end up burning uh, the lip of a three-year-old girl maybe once, you know, almost once a year out of a hospital typically this size. And so those cases just get settled and kind of go away, but they permanently disfigure somebody. So that's another company that we're starting. But um, in any case, I've now developed a lot of experience. It's now been... Um, you know, 12 years since I started OSU and about six years since I've left. So um, I've kind of now been able to take a look back and kind of uh, look at the things that have really supported me and the mistakes that I make, and that's uh, the topic of this talk. So like uh, our speaker said and Rebecca said, um, 
this is absolutely, if you're going to be successful, it is not because of an individual. It is a tremendous team effort uh, to get you to different places. And I've been fortunate to have the support of the CCTS office. Um, uh, as a result of that KL2, I had to um, pursue an MPH, which I didn't up, ended up getting, but I took uh, several classes that were very, very helpful. Uh, the corporate engagement office um, uh, was tremendous in push, pushing me down this path. The, my research was done at Children's, so I had to work with both the Children's Licensing Office and OSC's office, the um, Prototyping Department, Policy Department, uh, OSC Legal took a lot of uh, contracting and legal work, and the Media Department, like we talked about. So um, the second part is about practical advice for commercializing your IP, or if you're considering to get, go down this road. Um, the, I've developed now what I, um, what I tell my children a lot. Um, it's kind of this four, three, two, one rule, which was very foreign to me um, when I first started. Um, but I think if you're going to be successful, this rule, especially in the business world, this rule is very true, where the determinants of success is, of success is probably 40% the network you've generated, 30% your leadership skills, only 20% the merit of the idea and of your hard work and maybe 10% uh, luck. And that's very, very different than, you know, the kinds of determinants that got us to where we are, like, for example, to get into medical school or to get a PhD, I think. Um, and so that's very frustrating, for, honestly, to a lot of us that this is kind of the rule of success and you can't really do it all, you know, uh, in your adult career just by working very hard and, um, you know, doing the things that you think are right and, and having to um, depend on net, your network and your leadership skills. But really important, and if, if anything comes out of this talk, I hope a couple of tips that are, I've learned the hard way in this uh, direction um, I'll share with you guys and hopefully be helpful. But for networking, um, this is a, an African pro proverb that I really like. Um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And it's really true, and in, in both of these um, aspects are very important. You know, you do need to uh, go fast. The, wor the world in everything that we do requires um, speed in order for you guys to be successful. And so there are times where you are going to want to go alone and do things alone, and um, you can get things done definitely quicker if you do that. But uh, in terms of a venture, you really need to go together and really inspire and build a team around your ideas and around your work if you want those uh, things to be successful. And so the um, uh, tip, two tips I have. One is to think about interactions that you have with other people as either these kinds of three interactions. One, they can be a win-lose interaction where you win and uh, you basically exploit the person who's helped you or you've um, you know, taken advantage of somebody by your position of power or, or something like that. A lose-win situation where, you know, you not lose-win is a little stronger than I'm trying to get at, but, you know, a resident uh, needs some help and you, you know, help that resident or, and that's not really what I'm getting at, or it's, you let somebody kind of take advantage of you or you share your IP, for example, freely with other people or you, um, you're always the one that people go to for favors, but you don't really, you know, concern yourself with getting credit or, or doing that. And then, you know, that's a very common pathway that a lot of people in academics who are some of the kindest and most compassionate people, but that's also not a, a pathway to success. Um, eventually, you'll burn out of other people taking advantage of your generosity and your ideas. You really need to think about creating win-win interactions with um, people, which are tougher and more difficult to see how those interactions could be. But in every interaction that you do with people, you really need to look at how both of you are going to gain success and credit and advance from that interaction with neither person getting exploited and both people leaving that interaction as a beneficiary. Those are truly the only interactions that can sustain and those are the ones that get built upon to you know, uh, advance your research or your career or your you know, uh, commercialization effort. So think win-win. And another tip about networking that is very practical that I've that has helped me is when I would go to talks initially I, I would um, be struck by how when somebody would give a talk 
there would always be a surgeon, you know, or a, a scientist in the back of the room who would stand up and know very little about the information that was talked about, but criticize that talk from the back of the room, being like, oh, your p-values are terrible, or did you, you know, discount for this um, covariate analysis, or, you know, I've read way more than you have in 20 years ago, you know, something to basically make your research feel small, and you've put all this time and are so nervous about it, and it was really about them, you know, trying to build their stature and support their ego about, you know, your work. That would leave whoever is on this talk angry, and it would leave, and you'd see this wave of anger go through the room, like, what a jerk, you know, like, why would that happen? But the opposite of that, like, um, I found when I've either read good articles or I've seen good talks, if you then take the effort to compliment those people, you know, privately or afterwards, or send them, best is to send them an email. Like, you know, I really enjoyed what you worked on, and um, that was really helpful, and, you know, can you tell me more? Those people become just as, you know, angry, they become just as elated, you know, that somebody out in the world is paying attention to their research and found it could be useful. And those people will then, um, you know, go out and bend over backwards to help you, frankly. And so do that. You know, ever, from now on, the next talks you see really compliment the speaker if you find something that is uh, helpful or an article you read or a newsletter or a journalist writes a paper or somebody or somebody does something that you think is uh, valuable to your career, take the effort to go write them a letter and make an introduction and compliment them. And that is how you build your network of you know, valuable, like-minded people, and those people like working together. But that's also also a warning in that, that those kinds of interactions are very important. You know, we as scientists become siloed in what we do, and we bury ourselves in our very esoteric work, and we have to make those kinds of interactions and, you know, get our work disseminated into the public for it to be successful, really no matter what you do. So your network and building your network amongst like-minded people is really important. Um, and also along with that is be careful in sharing your intellectual property. Um, uh, in terms of lose-win situations, there are plenty of people who will come at you by saying, oh, Shu, you're the greatest ENT I've ever met. I'm like, really? I'm one year out of my fellowship, and you think I'm this fantastic? Um, and those people are really, you know, in some cases, trying to exploit you for things in ways that you don't understand. So be careful about that also. Your, your intellectual property is some of the most valuable things that you guys create, and you really... Um, need to be very thoughtful about how you develop a team to advance it and um, be careful about sharing that because uh, a lot there's a tremendous amount of value in the work you guys are doing and so leadership leadership is you know a term that everybody here is familiar with and um, you know obviously uh, this room is filled with great leaders but um, uh, specifically what I mean for academics is oh and I, this is another one of my great quotes is um, if not you, you know, then who else? Like in your field, you guys are the number one people in the work that you're doing across the board. And if you look, you know, in the country, there might be only a handful of people who have the, um, even the, a similar level of intelligence on the areas you guys are working on. And so if not you, then who else? And so that's kind of the mentality you guys need to bring to, um, uh, endeavors that you think are just too huge and just think that it can't be somebody like you who does it. But um, specifically for leadership, um, another really thing, important thing that's helped my career is um, the creation of teams. And so one of th this, I think, has been a strength of mine, but um, also really important. When you see somebody at this university that um, – is doing something similar to you, or it could be helpful. Um, the problem uh, in all large universities and great academic centers is those types of networking or interactions where you meet and work together do not occur. They do not occur at a, a fast enough speed, and eventually a lot of us get frustrated that we feel like the university isn't supporting us in our endeavors, and, you know, I need to maybe think about looking elsewhere, but you know, if I only had the support of other people or if other people knew what I was doing, I could get further along with our work. 
that is uh, not from this mal, you know, uh, content or, you know, this um, uh, kind of feeling that the university doesn't want you to succeed. That is a result of this place being so large and everyone already working 80 hours a week and having, you know, people ask of their time that nobody has the time to try to create these interactions. So you guys have to be the one who go out and cold call and meet somebody who's doing something uh, in a similar world uh, that you are, or it's not going to happen. So what uh, if you guys do one thing from this talk, do this. Um, in the work that you're doing uh, and in the work that you really enjoy doing, there is somebody here at this university who is looking at your work from a different lens, you know, whether it be an engineer who also has that interest or a CEO at the business school who thinks, you know, cardiac disease is the number one problem in the world or, or somebody, you know, that is doing it. Or you see a researcher who's working on that same research. You guys, if you could do one thing today is to go look through OSU's directories and kind of, you know, read the news and find somebody who's doing something similar to you, then just purely cold call that person. You know, make an introduction and say, hi, I'm, you know, Shu Das from, I'm an assistant professor in ENT, and I, you know, really um, admired your work. I'm doing uh, something similar, and I would love to take you guys out to lunch and then hear about your work. And that is something that no one ever taught us how to do, but it's so important. I mean, that is going to advance your guys' careers in anything uh, as much as, you know, uh, the work you do on a project or something. So go out and meet somebody who does something parallel. And that kind of behavior will then lead to larger and larger teams. And if you have now five people all with different backgrounds looking at your problem, whether, whether it's within the university or outside of the university, that is going to be an, an exceptionally powerful team versus just one of you or two of you or, or somebody within your department that you are assigned to. You guys need to go outside of your departments, and it can't be anyone else. No one else has time. It has to be you who cold calls those people. So go out and meet the people, and you can take it further. It can be outside this university, you know, a colleague of yours who is also working on it. But uh, make the effort to fly out to, you know, a, a common city or make appointments and meet them for lunch in New York during your conference or whatever. That um, is another characteristic that is not taught that will really advance um, your ability to succeed in what you're doing. And now finally, merit. Merit. Um, is something that I think everyone has a, a ton of in this room and we talked about and it's frustrating that you know merit is only about 20 percent of the effort but but there is it's it's unfortunately a reality you know if you could come up and do all the work to create a new invention or you know do some outstanding new research and the person with the resources could just come by and you know copy your invention and then get all the credit and you've seen that happen throughout history throughout uh, throughout everything, um, or you know, somebody in the in your lab, you know, steals your work or takes credit or whatnot. So instead of getting frustrated that you know hard work isn't appreciated or achieved, you just realizing that these are different rules that you live in, uh, in in the commercial world and the business world. If you're going to go in this, so by all means, merit is the foundation for what we do, but um, realize that it only can take you so far. And so this slide I point to show, like, Steve Jobs is, um, you know, one of the greatest inventors, but his name is first on all of their patents. You know, even though all of uh, this work, you know, was done by thousands and thousands of people. And so that's also really important to know is another thing about merit is definitely claim your own products. And so if somebody else is starting to claim your work or take credit for your work, that passive behavior, which a lot of, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people complain, come and say, Shu, I, you know, I've tried to do this, but, you know, my, the, I did all the work in my lab and somebody else's, my PI took credit for it and I can't advance any further. Um, and it's really a problem with not your PI or not the coworker or not, you know, a, a somebody at an outside institution. It's really you being not active and claiming credit for the things that you do. Um, and so as a result of that, that really gets to the final tip for merit is document your inventions in a handwritten notebook. 
So whatever ideas you have, whatever creative things you have, write them in a handwritten notebook. It can't be typed. It has to be handwritten. That uh, in the final um, uh, uh, lawsuit or when things are being uh, or an IP is being sold, for example, that um, is the final thing that determines whether an invention was truly created by somebody. It's gotten worse in the U.S. now. Our uh, patent trade office has gone to first to file, so this doesn't protect you as much. But this is still a habit that everyone needs to get when you create a great idea or you have something is to document that idea in a notebook. And then finally, luck. Um, luck is important, um, but really a lot of luck is created. Um, and so um, this is um, kind of a personality trait of two different types of people. Um, we have a lot of dreamers in the world, and we have a lot of doers in the world. And you need people who are doing both. Um, you know, you need people who, in the initial, can dream about an idea, but then they follow through with that idea when it gets boring and when it becomes not as fresh and it's not as, you know, sexy at the front end right when it got created. Um, it takes many years of work to create that dream into a reality. And so a lot of dreamers then have these problems where they, um, you know, get stuck or they're dependent on others or uh, they um, are risk averse but like to create the inspirations. And a lot of doers have these problems where um, they work, uh, are very productive and focused, but um, they have a lot of um, uh, lack of vision or lack, you know, they are afraid to take a lot of risk. So you kind of have to do both. And so that's an important thing. Also have your house in order. If you're ever going to make a big jump, um, and this, was, this slide is really more if you're going to go uh, into the commercialization world, but um, it's a very risky jump to um, go out and try to change your career and, and work on something. In order to have that, you have to have low levels of risk in the rest of your world, particularly for me was in your kind of your home and your finances world because uh, you can only um, put your risk in kind of one or two different levels of your life. And so if you're going to take a lot of risk in one area of your, like for example, your career, really that's not a, the same time to be taking a lot of risk in other places. And then realize luck is um, the accumulation of a lot of failures and a lot of uh, change. And so, you know, when the iPhone 3G came out, um, it was, you know, exceptional, but it's not nearly as good as it is, you know, with the, our current models. And so, uh, uh, ideas require a lot of revisiting and reinvention and um, a, a lot of persistence. And so, you will, um, you know, if you're going to be successful, it's going to be because you failed 10 times, you know, and so do not let failure be anything other than a learning process to becoming successful in the area that you frankly won't know where you're going to be successful, but it's really the refusal to accept failure as a uh, anything but a temporary setback or something that you learn from. And so uh, if you do come down to the uh, corporate engagement office, uh, the, another uh, important tip I think is um, is I, I would recommend people starting, starting the process of commercialization with possibly your second best idea. Um, if you have an idea, you're going to learn a ton of um, uh, information throughout the process of how to get partners and how to get things. And so if you have kind of just, you know, an idea that you think is, you know, going to be your life's work, maybe don't lead with that idea until you learn a lot about um, pitfalls and all the different types of skill sets you're going to need to learn to become an entrepreneur. And, but because uh, through that process, you will learn a ton, which will then potentially help you. And frankly, this isn't, um, is a little misleading in that most scientists don't know the value of their work. You know, there is a... Um, a lab in uh, Appalachia, which became the top uh, donor to Ohio University, that worked on an idea and then for 10 years had no revenues. And then they developed a lab technique that was helpful for a diagnostic lab that became a worth $100 million for that company. And it was an offshoot of trying to solve a problem that they'd been working on for 10 years. So you, you don't necessarily know what your best ideas are. but uh, So maybe this slide should say, you know, go with multiple ideas um, because, you know, you never know which ones are going to be um, uh, successful. And finally, um, 
you know, your ideas in themselves are worth a lot, but not worth a huge amount compared to the to the world. Like, um, you know, the they might be only five to ten percent of what the company uh, ends up being. And then finally, um, believe in yourself. Uh, Milton Hershey went bankrupt five times before the, before the age of 25 before he uh, created his what would now be almost a trillion dollar empire. And so thank you. If I could uh, be of help to anybody, um, please uh, feel free to call me, text me, um, email me at any time, and you know, wish you guys good luck. So thank you. I'm going to have you stay up there for a minute, and I, I'd like to open it up for any questions that anybody has for um, for Shu or any corporate engagement office or um, others. Sure. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yep. Yep. Now that was an easy one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And by show of hands, um, how many people here have? submitted something to an, uh, the corporate engagement office or are, uh, actively working on a commercialization handful of you guys. Oh, that's pretty good. So, yeah, that's great. Um, you know, uh, probably at the beginning part, um, another, another important um, kind of uh, mental process that goes through is when people engage with the corporate engagement office, and you, and you saw how much work they do, um, it's really not a huge office, unfortunately, um, to deal with as so many invention disclosures and licensing deals. So that office is one of the most overstrapped offices at any university. Um, you guys really need to be proactive uh, with that office, um, follow up with that office, and, you know, um, be the one that leads and being like, hey, what's going on with my invention disclosure? Or, hey, by the way, I already have, you know, $2 million of potential backers who want to uh, go with this. That will totally change, you know, the um, uh, prospects and um, uh, potential amount of uh, pecking order that gets put because they are overwhelmed. People who come to their office and say, hey, what's going on? Naturally, those projects get re-looked at and get, you know, prioritized. Uh, not, again, from any malintent, but um, because of how overworked they are. So don't just file a disclosure and then expect things to happen. You, it needs to be a, a very active process with the engagement office that you guys um, lead, you know, yourself. And so, uh, but good luck. That's the start of how the um, world goes. And then there's also another frustration uh, that... I went through that when you uh, uh, engage with the office, one of the initial responses is, um, well, this is how your, your patent's going to be assigned to the university, and this is uh, our sharing rights with the um, uh, end game of what happens. And so that's a frustrating process to think about the end you know, aspect before really thinking about all the work that gets there. Um, Regardless of what, how you go to commercialize an idea, if you go through the private world or the academic world, the, uh, there is going to be a tremendous amount of dilution, of equity sharing, of, um, of uh, kind of um, becoming a team where you grow. The co-founders go come from being 100% of that team uh, to 50 to 20 to 10 to 5, and so whatever. Um, realm that this happens in, it's it's very similar uh, throughout the other places. At the university, you know, they have a pre-arranged agreement on how you guys are going to share, you know, the revenue streams that come from something. Um, but they also give you a lot of work up front, like the prototyping that I saw, you saw and the patent costs of that you saw. And then they also facilitate getting you a team and finding you um, CEOs and engineers that could work on your ideas. Uh, if you go into the private world, you get a little bit more of that equity yourself to start with, but then you have to share that equity as you go about making that team, you know, and raising money to pay for those initial costs and um, uh, getting people to join your team. So either pathway is fine. Either pathway is hard and challenging. Um, uh, you cannot get frustrated with uh, the process um, because you feel like you're being, you know, on an island somewhat because of this such a large university or because you're seeing a lot of the 
the work potentially being diluted as you go further. That's a truth uh, wherever you go. And frankly, the uh, rewards are in creating those teams and working on the challenging problem. And so that is something you guys can also do yourselves, like we talked about in the earlier part, and really is where a lot of the rewards are in working at this university. Yeah. Well, that's a great question that I get a lot. Um, so I was lucky in that I was married to another physician. Um, and um, this occurred in 2013, which was about um, uh, maybe six years after our residency and fellowship had finished. Um, uh, I had luckily gotten a a merit scholarship to medical school, so I didn't have much debt, but um, my wife had uh, about $120,000 in debt. And so there was this fear that we were going to, especially Anissa, that we were going to starve and, you know, this was going to be not a good idea. Um, we had paid off all of our debt at that time, and then we had um, uh, realized that we could probably survive on one salary, you know, at least for several years until... Uh, things started to happen. Um, I did go to private practice and started my own clinic, which um, uh, initially I wasn't making as much money as I did work at the university, but I was making a lot more money per hour uh, than um, I working here uh, in the private world. And so um, uh, that was enough to, you know, I could work maybe 20 hours um, private and uh, or maybe 30 hours private, and it was kind of the equivalent of make, working 40 hours here. Um, so that, within a couple of years, you know, um, lent itself to uh, being able to survive. The one thing that you guys um, often don't realize is we are tremendously underpaid in terms of our value working at a large, the larger the institution you are. And so, especially with our economy now, if anyone here um, was forced to try to feed themselves, you know, by going private, you would find that your skills are exceptionally in demand um, because you're such talented people. And so you could get consulting jobs or work for a private place and work 20 hours. But that, there are going to be much more successes than failures, but I agree is such an intimidating and daunting step. Uh, and it doesn't need to be done Initially, I went private when I knew, you know, my ideas were going to be picked up and um, uh, that I was going to have some traction. Um, until that time, you can kind of work in both working on your idea and working at the university or, or whatnot. Um, but that is a very um, important um, uh, jump point that you have to decide. And, you know, it's also very individual, and I'm happy to, you know, give advice on anyone who's you know at that point trying to make that decision because that is one of the most daunting parts of the whole process yeah sure yeah yeah Uh, that is a great question. I am, um, you know, I was a general surgery intern where we, I slept one week like 20 hours. Um, and so that um, going through a surgery internship makes you realize, you know, there are many, many more hours than 40 that you can work in a week and not physically die. <laughs> but but um, I wouldn't say it's good for anybody or healthy, but you realize you can work that hard. And there were times, you know, when I, I did my first project uh, in Lauren's lab, um, I would work about my full day clinically from 7 till 6 p.m., then come back to the lab and work on a chinchilla experiment that I would finish like at midnight or so, uh, and then do that for about two or three weeks. I was just utterly exhausted trying to be both a clinician and a scientist. That's, I think, true of everyone in this room. You know, everyone in this room 
uh, has the capacity and does work exceptionally hard, you know. Um, and so the, the um, frankly, the thought process has to be instead of working that hard, how can I work smarter? Like how can I change my project so I'm not doing the so much work, you know, myself, but I'm really um, – inspiring a better scientist than me, you know, to do my project for me, you know, or or to collaborate on a project that will actually be more impactful because we both have clinical or, you know, uh, biological aspects. And that first project, I, you know, didn't realize Haemophilus used to agglutinates, and I didn't uh, shake my um, uh, Haemophilus uh, mixtures well enough. And so my two weeks of work, you know, went down the tubes. Like, it was basically a an error that I had made, you know, from doing that. So I think that was very representative of um, the problems that you, or not necessarily problems, that was an important learning experience and, you know, it was important to understand the work I did. But but um, if you can inspire, for example, uh, at the highest level, if you could inspire Lauren to be like, hey, Lauren, this is a really important problem and I can give you samples and can you have your lab work on this problem? I guarantee you that would have been, you know, dramatically more impactful in terms of the quality of research being done. And so that's really what people have to get in this lab. We have so many powerful silos working at this university in different aspects where this university, and it's not OSU, it's every university falls short, is we have some amazing cardiologists and some amazing cardiac physiology researchers, and they don't even know their names, you know, of who's working. And so if we had those physiologists come into the, you know, cath lab and actually see, you know, what's causing the heart attack and what the problems were, that would completely inspire that scientist to work on a different problem and vice versa. Now the, you know, cardiologist would have this amazing, you know, researcher and all this time working on a amazing problem. But the problem is that cardiologist doesn't go and call the cardiac physiology lab and say, hi, I'd like to meet everybody. And... And more importantly, vice versa, the physiologist, you know, uh, needs to be going and saying, hi, I just started as a physiology researcher here, and I just want to meet you guys and know what your interests are and see if we have anything in joint. Those, if we can, you know, create bridges of teams at this university, the power of our research will exponentially amplify and will free up a lot more time for people to work in areas that they have skills and expertise in. Yeah. I think we'll make this the last question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. So clear up is you know where oh, we just won uh, the People's Choice Award for the Consumer Electronics Show, and I uh, was just interviewed by um, you know several media outlets, and we're now. You know, I had dinner with the CEO of Procter & Gamble and such uh, this weekend. That came out of my the press that I got from uh, creating uh, the Sinu test. Um, out of that, there's so few academic ENTs who are trying to commercialize things. Um, the CEO from Menlo Park called me about four years ago and said, we have this idea. Uh, you know, shoot electrical current to treat headaches. I was like, this idea doesn't sound reasonable to me. I don't think it'll work. You know, if you want it to work, go do a double-blinded randomized placebo control with a sham device, and, uh, and I'm happy to sit on your medical advisory board. To their credit, we did that at Stanford, and the data came out working. And once that happened, and I was, you know, already involved, that's when I became the chief medical officer and became uh, investment. And as a result of of coming out of OSU in terms of you're saying the fear of coming out, I get probably one offer to join a company maybe every two or three months now um, by, hey, I've got this great idea. We need a you know a clinical doctor to help us uh, join our team to get there. And so that will happen to anyone who tries to com commercialize. And so you know, know where your most successful ideas are going to be or where your um, um, – uh, what's going to be, you know, the thing that leads you to the most outward success. I shouldn't even say that's, you know, uh, really the true success, you know, is where you can make the most impact for people's lives, I'd say is true success. But um, 
that comes from networking, you know, responding to those calls, um, uh, putting yourself out there, and you know, creating opportunities by um, uh, you know engaging with the world uh, in a much more active and deliberate way than I used to, you know, when I was aspiring to become an associate professor here. So, anyway. Yeah, thank you very much, and good luck to you guys. Thank and yeah, you. please contact me if I can be of help. So I think we're going to finish up. Bruce is going to um, Bruce Weinberg, um, who's really the director of our innovation, commercialization, and entrepreneurship, is going to say a few words. But I wanted to point out that there's actually an RFA that's currently out in the Office of Research. Jeff's standing up in the back, um, but that really could help you to move forward and think about pulling together. Um, teams that broadly go across the university working together. And this is a team science slash conversion science RFA. Um, it was released about a week ago. Um, it has a due date of March 31st. Am I correct? March 3rd. OK, give or take. Give or take a month. Um, so March 3rd. So I would really suggest to you, those of you who have ideas, really want to put together um, new teams around that, look at that. The CCTS as well has has multiple opportunities, including one that, that we actually are, are currently under review, which is really focused around um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, which is a collaboration. Again, uh, the CCTS has multiple departments. Um, but we'll continue to move these kinds of activities forward. One of the things I think that we will do in follow-up of this is actually send um, a quick survey to people about what are the questions, what are your ideas, what kinds of things would help to move things forward, that in next month we can make sure that we cover some of those ideas um, and move things forward. So I'll turn it over to Bruce. And again, thank you so much all for attending. Yeah, I, I really just want to give a, a few thank yous um, and then uh, a plug for the future. So the first thing is to thank all of you for being here. I know there are people watching at NCH. Um, thank you so much for participating. Um, and then I know that there are also people watching on their devices, and, and that's fantastic. And we really appreciate all of that activity and excited to have. I mean, frankly, when we came up with this idea, I, I, I think the notion that, that we could have gotten as many people in a room at 7.30 in the morning uh, to do this was was sort of staggering. So so just to see the turnout and, and all the different platforms is is fantastic. Um, I obviously want to thank um, Nationwide Children's um, uh, uh, Office of of uh, Technology Commercialization and Matt McFarlane, um, our corporate engagement Scott Osborne and Kevin Taylor. Um, as you can see on the slides, we have a number of other partners who've been critical in in a variety of ways. Um, I want to put in a, a quick plug for our upcoming, um, our upcoming event. Our plan is to make this basically the second Monday of every month during the academic year. Um, so uh, on February 10th, uh, Christopher Brewer will be talking um, and then uh, speaking about his experience. And then there will be a discussion by Christopher Schilling um, sort of highlighting resources at NCH for technology commercialization. So it will be sort of a similar format. And then we have Melissa Bailey and Vish Subramanian and so forth for the rest of the, the sem semester going on. Um, so we do have a few more minutes um, left over for some networking. I hope people will take advantage of it. Probably we still have some empty carbs. And we have some caffeine back on the table. Hopefully take advantage of that. We also have some propaganda on the table outside. Um, so be sure to collect that. And we'll look forward to seeing you uh, next month. Register two weeks early. And do please give us feedback. As I say, this was sort of an idea that a bunch of us had. Um, and and you know, if there are ways of making it better, um, we'd love to, to get that feedback. Thank you so much, and see you next month.